Doug Doty was a highly decorated Green Beret in the war in Vietnam. Before every mission, his group would go into a seven-day lockdown. They would study everything possible about the enemy, about the terrain, communications, supply lines, everything you can imagine, and every conceivable contingency. And before they left the room, they knew exactly what the point of their mission was. The particulars of their plan would surely change as the battle shifted, but they were completely unified on the point of the mission. Before they left that room, for the last time, they would circle up, their arms around each other's shoulders, and one by one repeat, I'm a dead man, signifying their willingness to die for their mission. Well, for the next seven Sundays, we're going to be studying revival and spiritual awakening. We'll come to understand the six revival realities, key principles that are critical for us to understand if we're going to cooperate with God. So you might say we're in a seven-week lockdown. And hopefully we will commit ourselves before these weeks are over to do anything God asks us to do to see revival and awakening come to our land. And today we're going to look at the first of those realities. So I encourage you to open your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. And if you will find that, you'll be ready to go. So as we begin today, allow me to ask you a question. Why should we pursue revival and spiritual awakening? And why does God bring such times to mankind in history? Well, the answer can be summed up in one word, God. Revival and awakening are for God and they are from God. So here's revival reality number one. A spiritual awakening is an invasion of the king and his kingdom. Follow along with me in your Bible, Nehemiah chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keeps his commandments, let your ear be attentive to, and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave to your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commandments, then even if your exiled people are at the Father's horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as my the dwelling for my name. They're your servants and your people, whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was the cupbearer to the king. So as you read through this passage, you notice the word you or your, yours, is repeated something like 20 times in seven verses. When Nehemiah was faced in his day with overwhelming need that we also see in our day today, he knew that God needed to be restored to his rightful place in his own heart and the hearts of his countrymen. This was the mission of his prayer. So it's very under, uh, important for us to understand terms to know what we're seeking. 
Now, last Sunday, we quoted Richard Owen Roberts' definition of revival as the following, the extraordinary movement of the Spirit of God in the hearts of his people that produces extraordinary results. The extraordinary movement of the Spirit of God in the hearts of his people that produces or extraordinary results. So this is a work that happens in the church when she enthrones Christ as king in his rightful place. It's us returning to our first love. For example, what is often referred to as the prayer revival of 1857 and 1858. A small prayer meeting was started with six people, six people in the Dutch Reformed Church in New York City, and it grew in a matter of months to 50,000 plus people meeting every day at noon for prayer. Now, how'd that happen? Well, every single church building in New York City was filled every day at noon. The church then, as a whole, was revived. So here's a second term that we need to define. First was revival. This is the second term is spiritual awakening. Spiritual awakening is the extraordinary movement of God that awakens the eyes of the unbelieving and brings them to salvation. Spiritual awakening is the extraordinary movement of God that awakens the eyes of the unbelieving and brings them to salvation. So this is a work that happens among the lost. In times of great spiritual awakening, hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps even millions, have been swept into the kingdom of God in a matter of months. For example, in the Welsh revival in 1904-1905, 100,000 plus people came to surrender to Christ in about nine months. At the time of the Second Great Awakening, there was about 30 million people in America. And during the course of the awakening, over 1 million people came to Christ. 1 million out of the population, about 30 million. If that same ratio uh, would happen in a nationwide awakening in our day, we would see 10 million people come to faith in Christ in a brief period of time. So, why should we pray for such a revival and awakening? Is it just for us? No, there's much more. Nehemiah prayed for revival for God's sake. He wanted God to be enthroned in his nation. He wanted the name of God to be known and revered and honored among all. He wanted more people to be revived and saved so that more could worship, more worship could ascend to the one to whom alone it is due. So notice the elements of Nehemiah's prayer. Number one, we have not enthroned you in our hearts. Look at verse 7 again. We have acted very corruptly against you. and We have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you've commanded your servant Moses. So the first element of Nehemiah's prayer was, we've not enthroned you in our hearts. Another element of this prayer is, but you are a covenant-keeping God. Look at verse 5. I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. So the second element of Nehemiah's prayer was, you are a covenant-keeping God. Yet a third element to his prayer is, you have made promises to your people. Look at verse 9. If you return to me and keep my commands and do them, though, uh, though those of you who have been scattered were in the remark, remark remote part of the heavens, I'll gather them from there and bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. So the third element was, you have made promises to your people. You've made promises to your people. And then the fourth element of his prayer is, so restore and revive us so that you'll be revered. Restore and revive us so that you'll be revered. Look at verse 11 once again. O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name. 
Years ago, Jonathan Edwards said, and I quote, God hath had it much on his heart from all eternity to glorify his dear and only begotten son. And there are some special seasons that he appoints to that end, wherein he comes forth with omnipotent power to fulfill his promise and oath to him. And these times are times of remarkable pouring out of his spirit to advance his kingdom. Such a day is a day of his power. End of quote. Now I want you to think about that uh, cycle of spiritual awakening that we introduced last Sunday. If you have a copy of the One Cry book, it's on page 51. Friends, this is the common repeated pattern of Scripture and in human history. God is always seeking to bring more and more people, His people, to Himself. In great seasons of corporate or national revival, thousands of people are blessed. But the greatest thing that happens is that Christ Jesus is enthroned again as the Lord over the church. He is loved and served as he should be, and the world worships its creator and savior. So let me ask you, why are you seeking revival? Hopefully you are. Is it for your own sake? so that you might feel a, more able to live a comfortable life? Is it just so our nation we prosperous and at peace and then all this chaos and animosity would cease? I mean, I think all of us would like would, would admit, if we were honest, we'd like for our nation and our world, for that matter, to be rid of COVID-19, right? We'd like to be able to have civil discussions with our fellow Americans when it comes to our political differences and not have the caustic atmosphere that we've seen for many years now, right? Let's be honest. Our lifestyle, our way of life in this country has been undermined and uh, so much about our lives is not what it was just a short time ago, just a year ago. Is that why you're seeking revival just so we can return to the economic prosperity of a little over a year ago, or the um, restoration of civility, common courtesy that we've seen in generations past. Is it, it, I hope that you're seeking for revival for something much more than that. Are you seeking revival for God? Are you praying that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven? Just back in October, November, we examined the model prayer, the prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples to use as a pattern, a model for prayer. And we studied together what it means to have Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of God, come and for his will to be done. But you know what? If we're really desiring revival, really hungry for revival, where does it come from? Revival is for God, but revival is also from God. Why is God mentioned over 20 times in Nehemiah's prayer? Look at this prayer again, beginning with verse 5. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and who keeps his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. The prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night with your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself, and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We've not obeyed the commands, the decrees, and the laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I'll gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name. In verse 10, they are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great strength and mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant, to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. So why did Nehemiah 
mentioned God so many times in his prayer to God is because no one can bring a revival except God. Our role is to cooperate with God, but he is so, he's the sovereign sender of revival. So Nehemiah's first resort is not to contact the king or to contact his own countrymen. He cried out to God for seven months. Seven months. It was a Godward prayer. You look at verse 5 again. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. So Nehemiah knew that God was the Lord God. He is the God over every God of this world, and he has authority to do whatever he desires. Nehemiah knew that he was the God of heaven. His power is not confined to this earth. He's also, it's also heavenly. He rules over the earth. Nehemiah knew that his God was a great and awesome God. He has the ability to do things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard. Nehemiah knew that God was the covenant-keeping God, that he will fulfill his conditional promises if his people will cooperate. God is not only loving, he's kind, and he longs to save his people. He is motivated to send revival and awakening because of his nature, his perfect love. So, Nehemiah prayed for an invasion from the king. And when the king comes in his power, incredible things begin to happen. In Nehemiah's day, a wall was built around the entire city of Jerusalem in 52 days, according to Nehemiah 6, verse 15, and the entire nation returned to God. Now, we're going to read about that, study about that in the coming weeks. But a genuine national movement of spiritual awakening produces astounding results. J. Edwin Orr, one of our greatest revival, American revival historians, recounted that in the first great awakening, 50,000 plus people came to Christ in New England out of a population of about 340,000, or almost 15%. During what's called the Prayer Revival, 1857-1858, there was a report of 50,000 people coming to Christ weekly. Weekly. The Holy Trinity Church in Chicago had 157 members in 1957 before the Awakening. And about 1,400 plus members the next year in 1858. The pastor of St. John's Wood Presbyterian Church declared that after the Welsh Revival, in which 100,000 people came to Christ in nine months in 1904-1905, that a mighty unseen breath of the Spirit was doing in a month more than centuries of legislation could accomplish. Did you hear that? The mighty unseen breath of the Spirit was doing in a month more than centuries of legislation could accomplish. Folks, here's what we've got to understand. And this is so timely for where we're at right now as a nation. That no political equation, no governmental action can resolve the deepest problems we face as a nation. Yes, some immediate change can be legislated. Elections do have consequences. And I firmly believe that believers should be voting and supporting candidates and parties with the best support of a biblical worldview, if at all possible. But we've got to understand we can't pass off the responsibility that we have as ambassadors for Christ ourselves. We can't sit and wring our hands over why lost people are acting like lost people. Of course they're going to act that way. But the problem is, when the salt has lost its saltiness and the light is dimmed and the ambassadors of Christ are not going and serving and representing and we're expecting the courts, we're expecting the government, we're expecting the office holders to do what the church should be doing. Politics and government can't solve any long-term social problems. All of those problems are heart-related. They're heart issues. They're sin issues. 
let's just look at three of the greatest spiritual and social disorders, diseases that we face as a nation among many. But these social and spiritual diseases of abortion, divorce, and pornography. And I don't talk about these issues to cause anyone listening to have a guilt trip over their past, but I have to address these issues, okay? We are so callous, for example, about abortion that it hardly registers with us anymore that we are still killing about one million babies a year in this nation. One, one million a year, roughly. One of the co-authors of the One Cry book told of visiting the Incan ruins in Mexico with his wife, and they were awed by the massive pyramids and the amazing structures, wondering what kind of a civilized people in that day and time were able to accomplish those feats without the aids of all the cranes and heavy equipment of our day. And then their guide took them to a large pit and showed them where babies by the thousands were sacrificed. Suddenly, the author said, our stomachs turned as we were reminded that any nation that could slaughter its young was no civilized country. But we've doing, been doing that in support of abortion on demand since 1973. And we should not be surprised that God has lifted his hand of blessing on this nation. And we're all sick of the horror of divorce. A second issue I'll address briefly. I mean, no one wins in divorce. We know that. And by the way, this has deeply affected my own family. Okay? But children are devastated. Husbands and wives are crushed. And succeeding generations are often demoralized and often find themselves afraid to enter into a marriage relationship because their own parents' marriages didn't succeed. And sadly, the divorce rate uh, in the church among Christians in America is only slightly different, slightly less than that of unbelievers, people without a Christian foundation. But then there's the issue that no one wants to talk about. No one wants to address. And the one issue that we want to pretend doesn't even exist, that's pornography. About $3 million plus are spent every second in this country on internet pornography. $3 million a second. Every 39 seconds, a new internet pornography site is created in this country. Every 39 seconds. Tragically, America leads the world with about 89%, 90% of the pornographic web pages worldwide on the internet. Over 244 million pages and rapidly climbing while Germany is a distant second with 10 million web pages. You talk about a pandemic. There is absolutely no greater plague in our land as it destroys men and women, women as well, because one in three viewers of pornography is female, and children, too, at unprecedented levels. Pastors and churches are seeking violently to hold back the flood of abortion, divorce, and pornography with little to show for it. We throw up our hands in resignation, realizing that our best efforts are making little progress. And this is to say nothing about the issues of racism or homelessness or drug use or poverty or alcoholism, etc. What could possibly stop this tsunami of moral ills? Is there any conceivable solution, honestly? Only a mighty spiritual awakening, as we have never known in our past, can reverse these plagues. We need a massive course correction that only the sovereign king can bring. Without it, we are going to continue to spiral down into moral oblivion. We desperately need God to rend the heavens and come down and manifest saving power. And he's done that in the past. He's done it before. Every major awakening in American history has been followed by extensive cultural transformation that nothing else could accomplish. So why would we think that just having the right president in the Oval Office or just having the right uh, number of conservative judges on the Supreme Court, etc., would 
solve all of our problems. Know the right legislation. We need God to come. And when God opens heaven and releases a rapid expansion of his kingdom on earth, everything changes. Everything benefits. Even those who are not Christian end up benefiting as a result. These divine invasions that we call spiritual awakening are beyond the norm, over the top, clearly recognizable interventions by a gracious God that are easily distinguishable from the normal, regular work of the church. During great, widespread awakenings, the doors of heaven are opened with extraordinary wideness, and we're privileged to see and experience God's kingdom coming to earth. It's a reminder of his unfathomable love for humankind. Now, the demographics tell us that there are right out 12,900 people within a 15-mile radius of our location here in El Dorado Springs, Missouri. 12,900, pretty dispersed population here in Cedar County. So that's a few miles east of Nevada and not quite as far south as Stockton, but a 15-mile radius according to the demographics that I've seen, there's about 12,900 people. So what would it look like? What effect could it have if revival came to our community? And as a result, the spiritual awakening that followed revival, 15% of those 12,900 people came to Christ as their Lord and Savior over the course of 2021. That'd be approximately 1,935 people. Coming to Christ for the first time, you think that would make a huge difference? So what would revival look like? Not just for this community, but for our nation. What if revival came merely to the people of El Dorado Springs, approximately 3,500, 3,600? And that revival led to a spiritual awakening here. What would happen if 15% of those 3,500 people or 525 people came to Christ this year of 2021? As a result, as it happened in the first great awakening, 15% of the population. What would it look like in our nation? What would change if every church was filled every day at noon, for example, for months on end with praying, obeying believers? What would this change in government, in our schools, in our homes, in our culture be as a result? See, when the king invades, the church is revived, the lost are saved, the culture is transformed, and the mission is expanded. So our goal for the next few weeks is not to turn our attention to seek revival for revival's sake. We're turning our attention to seek God because revival is for God and his kingdom and it's from God. Perhaps the most amazing thing about Nehemiah's cry out to God is the boldness in which Nehemiah asked. It's, ne it's Nehemiah's boldness. Derek Kidner, in his commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah, said, Nehemiah is empty-handed, but not uninvited. He knows the threats and the promises of Scripture well enough to make a strong, not a tentative, plea. Nehemiah, like Ezra the scribe before him and Moses before him and every humble believer who longs for God's return, cries out for God to prove himself, to magnify himself, to show the world how great a God he is. And then even more amazing, in light of Israel's past sins, God heard and answered Nehemiah's cry. And I wonder if we will be the people who seek revival for the right reasons. So I'm challenging you, believer, wherever you're at, to spur your church on in crying out to God for revival. For the right reasons. To be people who will live to see the king enthroned in worship, who cry out for Jesus' sake, who see revival and spiritual awakening come for his glory in our day. 
Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what you want to do in our hearts and lives, what you want to do in our churches, what you want to do in our communities, what you want to do in our states, what you want to do in this nation that has strayed so far from you. And when we, as the church, as Christians, look in the mirror, we see the, the guilty people, the people who are largely responsible for the moral decay in our culture is we fail to be salt and light. We've got comfortable with a convenient American dream version of Christianity. Forgive us and help us not to sleep well until we see you and what you want to accomplish and we throw ourselves on your mercy and plead daily, nightly, for you to come and bring revival because it's for you and your kingdom's sake and it's from you as the Lord God Almighty of the universe. We want your will to be done. We want your kingdom to come. And we pray this in the powerful name of our Savior, even Jesus. Amen and amen.